Welcome to this episode of the ISF Podcast from the Information Security Forum, the leading authority on cyber, information security, and risk management. I'm Tavia Gilbert, and I'm so glad to welcome you to today's conversation with ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin. If you're a longtime listener, we hope that you'll celebrate with us both our anniversary and our return to production. We're so pleased to share that the ISF podcast is entering its fifth year of production, and we are very glad to be returning with new programming after taking a break this spring and summer. In today's episode, Steve and I bring you conversation about what we've gained and lost from altering our workplaces and our workflows during the pandemic, how heads of enterprises can support their teams throughout this unprecedented period of change, the difference between good leadership and great leadership, and more. But before I bring in Steve, I want to bring you closer and share a little look behind the scenes. ISF's media and Steve's and my collaboration experience challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, challenges that I imagine you too have faced, suddenly shifting from frequent face-to-face meetings to a 100% virtual workflow, having to rapidly implement new technology, and figuring out how to plan for the future just when that became exponentially more difficult. Our greatest challenge, we found, was in trusting each other, being transparent with each other, even allowing space for vulnerability with each other. Steve and I are longtime colleagues with a shared professional mission, and trust and transparency have taken time to develop. What we discovered this year was that when we had to make a choice, either pull back from producing this podcast or deepen the work, grow in our collaboration with each other, and recommit to the podcast and to new vulnerability with each other, we both chose to reconsider, renew, recreate, and relaunch. So we're back with a refreshed mission. As ever, the ISF podcast will continue to offer cutting-edge conversations tailored to CISOs, CTOs, and other global security pros, as well as periodic reports on timely cybersecurity topics such as the threat horizon or human-centered security. But we want to offer you more education, information, and inspiration than ever before. So we're going to be expanding these conversations to include leaders, writers, speakers, and more people traditionally outside of the security space. Whether we're hearing from a musician or a CRO, the head of a global nonprofit, or the head of a Fortune 500 company, Steve will bring you, your teams, and your partners insights from rule breakers, collaborators, culture builders, and business creatives who manage their enterprise with vision, transparency, authenticity, and integrity. Let's talk about leadership, because especially since COVID has taken over the consciousness of the globe, but not only since, you have a lot of feelings and opinions on leadership. I'm curious what has changed for you during this time? What has developed in your thinking about leadership because of the pandemic. But maybe let's start, that's sort of a later question. Let's start with what you think leadership is. What's your idea about what a good leader does and what a great leader does? Is there a difference between the two? Yeah, I think there is a difference. I think that very many people can be good leaders. Very few people can be great leaders. And the difference is that there is a school of thought that says you can teach good leadership. So you can teach somebody about how they should communicate. You can teach them that, you know, integrity is important. You can teach them that they should continually try to improve and encourage their staff or the people that they work with to do similar. You can teach them that listening is a very important skill that you should develop. And there's no shortage of courses that will enable people to understand how they can craft vision, how they can convey that in an enthusiastic fashion, how they can really enable alignment with that at a very mechanical level. Hmm. So for me, if you are able to do those things, 
then you've pretty much got a number of the boxes ticked in terms of what people from the outside would perhaps look at and say, yeah, he's a, he's a pretty good leader. You know, I understand what he stands for and what his business stands for. He's got his team that are aligned with that. And as I say, I think there are a number of people out there who do that very, very well. And there are all levels in an organization. You know, you don't have to be a CEO to be a good leader. You can be working in a call center. You can be working as a plumber, for instance. You could be doing anything at all to be a good leader within you know, the environment where you are providing some form of leadership or guidance to other people. Great leaders are very few and far between because great leadership requires you to recognize that you're not that great. <laughs> it requires you to be brutally honest with yourself, to recognize that there are occasions upon which you have got it very badly wrong hmm. and that you aren't perfect. And I think for very many leaders, particularly if you look at you know, those at the higher levels of leadership within organizations or politics or whatever we want to point that reflection back of yeah you could have done better is a very tough one for some to come to terms with so i think great leaders for me are those that aren't afraid to get it wrong aren't afraid to make a judgment call on the basis that they might not get it right every time but they possess qualities that also encourage others to do similar. So what you end up getting is a team that performs not just to a certain level, but goes beyond because you're encouraging everybody to give of their best, to experiment, to really be safe in recognizing their fallibility. And I think fundamentally, for me anyway, great leadership requires that recognition that you haven't arrived at the end of the journey. You've only just begun. So if you imagine that from, let's take a chief executive position, it may have taken you years to achieve this exalted position that you've always wanted. And then to recognize that actually now you're only just beginning is tough for some. But for me, that's the way that it is because you know true leadership is a journey. You never arrive at the end point. You will always have to make decisions about which road to take. You will always have to make decisions about which people to take with you, which people perhaps to leave behind. But you do that in a way that is human. And if you can do that with your team, if you can create an environment that encourages them to flourish in the same way, then that's very, very special. That's magical. That will create something that you never imagined you could create. That's great leadership because people are going far and beyond what they thought was ever possible. And there aren't very many people like that around. Is it fair to think that that definition of good leadership is really just competent leadership? I think it is competent leadership. I would certainly say that. I think, unfortunately, I would still incline to label it as good because I think there are a number of people who don't even hit that level. And I think that when, you know, the going gets tough, then you tend to identify those people that are competent and good versus those that really shouldn't have been in that job in the first place or shouldn't have had that role in the first place. And they may have arrived there for a whole variety of different reasons. That's absolutely fine. But Competency for me gets you so far. Good takes and builds on competency. And then great is what you should aspire to as a leader. Has your perspective about what makes great leadership been influenced by what you yourself as leader have experienced over these last six months or so of the pandemic? I think that what we've seen over the past six months, and I fear we will continue to see for some time to come, is whole range of different emotions that people are going through, whether they be in the workplace or not. I think that people are confused. People are angry. People wish that there was an easy solution. People don't necessarily know all the time how they should be behaving, how they should be responding to the different messages that they're getting, for instance, around the pandemic 
around staying safe, around, you know, returning to work or a whole range of, of these things. And so I think that there is a general desire for some kind of consistent leadership in that space, whether you view that as being, you know, within a corporate environment, whether you view it as being politically, it doesn't really matter. I think people are looking for some kind of direction, some sort of North Star, if you like, that they could at least follow. And I think that we've seen a shocking inability at a number of levels to provide that form of leadership. If you think about some of the things I was talking about around, you know, good leadership, let's not even get close to great leadership. Let's just stick with good. Yeah, you know, I talked about communication. I talked about the need to clearly communicate in a language that people can understand that inspires them perhaps we see very many mixed messages from the political side of things that are clearly being put out there for reasons of political expediency rather than anything else within companies you know we have a whole range of different challenges as people who run organizations in terms of how we cope with what will be one of the worst recessions in living memory how do you motivate a workforce in that environment how do you motivate people that perhaps at some point you may need to say goodbye to because your organization simply can no longer sustain the cost because you haven't been able to overcome some of the real challenges that are out there. For me, you need to be having those conversations well ahead of time. You, know, you need to be talking to people about the role that they can play in helping to avoid that potentially because everybody has a role to play in that. And I think that we're lacking some of those things as well. So I, I think that things have changed very significantly. I, I think that there is a, a real appetite for strong leadership. I think there's a recognition as well that perhaps people won't get it right every time. And I think that leaders need to recognize that and stop pretending that they do know what's right. They don't have all the answers. You know, we've been moving over the last six months or so through a whole range of very, very different circumstances where you have to change, you have to flex, you have to pivot you have to all of those things that people talk about right bottom line is tomorrow may be different from today that creates uncertainty leaders recognize that leaders provide a frame that you can at least hold on to and communicate regularly about how it might have changed and therefore what they think the right route is in order to deal with that new environment but they do it by really responding to the why the what's in it for you and treating people respectfully, not dogmatically, mm. not based on something that can't be substantiated or that you're going to change after five minutes because it suits you. If you don't know what you're doing, at least have the decency to come out and say you don't know what you're doing, but this happens to be the thing that we're going to give the best shot to, and I need your help in making it work. I'm fine with that. But please don't tell me that you know what you're doing and then clearly demonstrate five minutes later by doing something totally different that you didn't have the first clue and you're just being bounced from pillar to post like everybody else that lacks integrity and i think people see through that very very quickly and i, I hope that those kinds of leaders will very soon find themselves without leadership positions mm. you mentioned the emotions that people are experiencing fear anxiety anger grief you know certainly people have lost loved ones or lost jobs, really, there's a lot of pain. Hmm. Do you feel like you as a leader are making more space for that emotional reality of your employees and your partners than you used to? Personally, I don't, I don't think I'm very good at it. I would love to say that, um, that I do. I, I don't. Um, that's a brave thing to admit. I, I think it's realistic. I think that, uh, you know, very often you will get caught up in, in something that clouds that for you. And so you don't see that. And I think one of the things that I've learned has really become much clearer for me over the last six months is you really do need to benefit from time. What I mean by that is you don't need to rush to make a decision. Take the time to just consider it in a bit more detail. And what I've found is if I'm able to do that, then yes, I do. I am able to take into account just why somebody might have behaved in a certain way or why some supplier perhaps did what they did. Or do you get where I'm coming from? Because you've got the benefit of thought, of, of time, of 
context. And I think very often when you're running a business, people, you know, will come to you and expect you to make decisions based on perhaps material that they provide you with or quite often on the fly. And I think that uh, I've certainly tried over the last, to say, whatever it is, six or seven months, to build in a little bit more think time because I've lost that. I used to travel a tremendous amount. As you know, Tavia, I was, you know, always on an airplane. And actually that gave me really valuable thinking time because I was cut off from email and phones and that kind of thing. And I miss that. So what I've tried to do to get some of that back is to block out times in my diary when I'm pretending to fly to give me time to have that space, that think time, that because that allows me to put things into context. And I think that I then make better decisions. Yeah. When you say that you're not very good at that emotional component, but you combine that with your focus on the human element as a leader of your own organization in the security space that you represent globally. And I, I wonder if that awareness of your own need to grow in a certain area helps you see even more clearly where you already have expertise into that human element, that we cannot separate ourselves from our own humanity. And especially at this time of crisis, which continues on, is that awareness of your reservation around emotion teaching you where you want to deepen a skill, cultivate more comfort or more ease with an emotional component? because it is so related to that human component. I I think that if I look specifically at my own organization, then one of the things that has become really clear during the period of pandemic has been that you can really try to dress it up however you like, but fundamentally businesses will succeed or fail based on the people that they have in them. And I'm immensely proud of what a small organization like the ISF has managed to do over that period. So we were very fortunate. We didn't have to let people go. We didn't furlough people. We continued to deliver in line with everything that we said we would deliver to our members, to our clients. We overcame some of the real challenges of lack of access. You know, a lot of what we do is based around physical access. It's about workshops. It's about seeing people. It's about running chapter events. And I didn't come up with solutions to those things. The people that I work with came up with those solutions because I asked them to help because we had a problem. So when we talk about, because, you know, security is so like the tech environment and we can so easily, you know, get wrapped up in technology and how valuable technology is and, you know, artificial intelligence and it's going to solve this and do this and do that. But actually, if you really want to solve a problem that is critical, I would rather have a team of people every single day of the week than a machine because they will be imaginative. They will support each other. They will come up with the goods. And so that I think is why I say, you know, the last six months or so has been a really fortunate period for us. And I think everybody has learned a lot about the people that they work with. And that's again, why I say that businesses are founded upon people. You cannot run a business without good people. But the job of the leader is to create the environment for those people to be successful and to allow them to make mistakes and to try things that you haven't tried before, knowing that it may not end well, but you have to give people the opportunity. And uh, that's the sort of one thing that I've become very much more aware of is the role of people. And, but people are not easy. <laughs> you know? And so I can completely understand why, why some people listening to this might think, oh, well, you know, give me a computer any day of the week. But if you can master that art, and it is an art of working with people, then you get a heck of a lot further than by relying on technology. I think if you're working in a business that you know, provides some degree of service to others. Do you think you're sharing more authentically who you are, your vulnerabilities, your emotions, which certainly you've experienced your own stresses and anxieties and losses during this time. Do you think that you're more willing to share that vulnerability with people around you than you were before? I think one of the interesting things that has happened over the course of the six to seven months is that because we have all 
we've been so dependent upon things like you know zoom or teams or wh whatever it happens to be to communicate we've all probably given a little bit more of ourselves in order to try to personalize the experience because normally we would be so reliant on the unseen and what i mean by that is if you meet with somebody you know very little of, of what you pick up from that individual is based around the words it's based around the body language it's based around the general sort of feeling that you have people describe it that way you know i feel comfortable with so and so you don't have that with a computer so therefore you have to work exceptionally hard to try to share something of yourself, to build that degree of, of intimacy, if you like, to get to a point where you can transact business because it's about trust. It's about building that. So I think that everybody has to give a little bit more of themselves. And I think that for me in particular, that has involved me perhaps sharing more than I would traditionally have done prior to that um, because that's my way of, of demonstrating that, you know, I do actually care. And so I'm sort of, I suppose, showing you know, showing a bit of me in, in the hope that somebody else will show a bit of them and then we can go from there. So yeah, quite possibly. How does that feel to you? Hmm. I think in the beginning, I, I found it very scary because you, if you are running a business or, you know, in any sort of leadership position, you, I think, assume that people will perhaps want you to always have an answer, always be you know, pretty secure in what you're doing and so on. And yet one of the things that happened with the pandemic is it threw everybody into a place where they had no point of reference. And yet from a leadership standpoint, you have to provide some form of leadership out of it. And so I don't know whether it was right or whether it was wrong, but my approach to that was, was actually to be very much more me, I guess, than I might have been otherwise. And, uh, You'd have to ask people who work for me whether or work with me whether or not that was the right thing to do. But that was a decision I took. That was the approach. And that's what I've been doing. Well, I have talked to people who work with you and a handful of people have remarked about the shift, that it has been very powerful for them to experience, you know, honestly, that intimacy that you referenced. And it's that's maybe not a word that we've used in our four years of relationship over this podcast project that we have. But that willingness, your willingness to be vulnerable, your willingness to express caring has moved and inspired people around you. I think, you know, as a, as a leader, as you have a responsibility to the people that are working with you. And you, I think, need to demonstrate a willingness to relate to some of the challenges that they're going through. Uh, as you said, you know, some people have lost people to the illness. Others have themselves have come down with it. Some of them know people who've lost their jobs. And, you know, these are, these are major, major shifts. And we can't sit back and pretend that they don't affect people. They do. And I think my job is to try to create an environment where people recognize that it's okay for them to just deal with that in whatever way they need to deal with it, but to provide an environment that is uh, supportive of that on the basis that we hope it never happens to us. And I think that that is, is hugely important. You have to provide a framework for people. You have to provide them with security that they know what's going to happen at least for the next five minutes. And that if something is going to happen after that, that you'll tell them about it. So I think one of the things I've done, I've tried to do a lot more of is to never promise anything that I haven't been able to then follow up and deliver on from where I come from. Anyway, that's very, very important. That sort of sense of integrity. So I've tried to be more open with people about what we're trying to do as a company, about what we're trying to do going forward, about the challenges that we face. I've tried to engage them more in terms of how we can solve some of those challenges that are related to recession rather than to pandemic. Although you could argue the two are entirely related, which of course they are. But for me, they are different. And recession is you know, where we are now and we have to find a way forward. We can no longer just hunker down and, and hope for the day when it goes back to being the way that it was. It will not do that. And so we have to deal with it the best way that we can. And we are in an environment that is new for very, very many people. And there is no perfect answer to that. But if we figure it out collectively, we'll come up with a far, far better solution 
than if I sit in isolation somewhere at the top of a mountain and suddenly come down and tell everybody this is the way it's going to be. So that sort of you know, collaborative approach to problem solving has been something that we've benefited from hugely. And um, that's something that I want to continue to do. Have the people you work with surprised you in how responsive they are to you saying, I don't have the answers and I need your help problem solving? Do you feel like you are receiving more because you're giving more? I think that the ISF team has responded exceptionally well. I think that they have universally seen it as a challenge to overcome, if I could put it that way. And I think that there have been some really interesting suggestions as to how we can go about doing things. They've responded far better than I think I would have expected. And, you know, we need to carry on doing that because that differentiates us from any other organization. And that means that we can continue to work together as a group. It means that we can continue to provide services and products to our members, to clients. And I really do believe that that's a strong differentiator for us. Have you had conversations with your peers in leadership? Are these ideas of sharing more, supporting the emotional experience of your employees, being vulnerable, letting people know that you might not have all the answers? Is this something that you think is happening industry-wide or what are you hearing from people who are also in leadership? Is this a shift in business overall? I think you have to look at the, the different vertical sectors. You know, we start to get here into the realm of company culture. We get into the realm of what is acceptable in certain businesses, for instance. And I think that some of them are probably, yeah, probably afraid to challenge that. I think, again, you know, I'm very fortunate in that I work with a relatively small group of people. Yes, they're spread all around the world, but we're able to make changes to a culture, if you like, that perhaps larger organizations wouldn't find so easy. I also don't have the challenge of having to deal with a stock price. So I don't have to meet analysts, for instance, and talk about what we're doing. I, I do have to deal with a large number of members, of course, who do expect us to deliver what we said. I do have to deal with the expectations of a board of directors. And so I do have some of those constraints, but I'm not comparing myself with a, I don't know, a large retailer, for instance, in the public environment or, um, you know, an airline very difficult for those things to just sort of completely change. So I think I'm in a much more fortunate position from that point of view. But yes, there are other organizations that have, you know, gone some way to changing that. There are others that have gone the other way. And there are some practices out there that I find frankly horrific, hmm. you know, people installing software onto laptops so that they can check whether or not people are working. That for me, is probably a good example of how not to try to run anything. If you can't trust people, then either they shouldn't be working for you or you shouldn't be working with them. It's really simple. So I think that it's brought about all sorts of different behaviors, some of which I would hold up as being good and others I would hold up as being, yeah, probably room for improvement. I'm wondering who, if there's a person in your history that you look up to as a leader who exemplifies the kind of leader you want to be. Where did you find inspiration in your coming up in the world as a leader? There wasn't really any one. I mean, this is the point at which people will reference people like Nelson Mandela and, uh, you know, a variety of others. For me, it wasn't that I didn't have a great sort of leadership epiphany one day or read, you know, a particular book and suddenly think that's it, that's the direction. It was more transformative it happened over a longer period of time it was a, a sort of a hybrid of different people that i had met throughout my career right from the very early days who had done things that i thought yeah that's i get it i understand that i want to remember that i would like to emulate that i wish i could do something like that one day so it was much more of a collage if i put it that way of what i considered to Actually, at the time, not even be good or great or anything like that, but just worked for me. I could relate to it. And I think that that is the, probably the most valuable thing that I could say. You know, if you can relate to people or people can relate to what you're saying, then you can achieve great things collectively. And so it was that, you're taking different bits and pieces throughout a career that I think has really got me to the point I'm at now. But again, you know, I go back to what I said a little while ago. 
it's not an end point, you know, it's a journey. And if you imagine that on a journey, you will be continually picking up different things along the way, that for me is the leadership process. You know, you get things wrong, you learn from that. You get things right, you try to remember to do that again. You see somebody else do something and you think, yeah, that could work, or that had a really great outcome, or I wish I'd thought of that. So you continually are learning and developing and growing. And, you know, I think I'm fortunate that I've had the opportunity to, to see some of these things in a huge number of different cultures, large number of different countries. And I'm very conscious that a lot of people don't get that opportunity. You offered one insight into how you've coped with the loss of your travel time, which is where you are quiet and can think, ruminate without the pings and beeps of needing your attention. What are some other new practices that you've developed to deal with either a disruption in your typical work process or a disruption in your own life with the challenges and the stresses of this unique time? I think I've become very reliant on other people. More than in the past? I think so. I think because everybody is, I mean, it's changing slightly now because there's a little bit more freedom of movement. But certainly in the early days of that sort of global lockdown, you couldn't see people. So you had to really fall back on the trust and the relationship you'd built with them. And I think that that has interestingly caused an increased reliance on some of those key people that was probably always there, but which you've had to do even more because you haven't been able to physically see them. And so that's something that, that's different. <laughs> I think the other thing that I've done differently is probably create more, this will sound strange perhaps, but I use paper more. Hmm. So I, um, I try to break away from technology if I can. I'll mix up the different media that I use. So I won't use, uh, some days I'll go without video. I'll use the phone, for instance. I had a call today and they said, oh, Steve, we can't see you. And I said, no, you're right. I said, it's because we're using the phone. But people forget these sorts of things. So I do, I mix it up a little bit. You know, you don't always um, have a screen on. But I use a lot of paper now. Um, I'll sketch out ideas. I didn't do that before because I traveled so much quite early on, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago in my Gartner days, I decided that I couldn't carry all of these reports and things that I needed. So I switched completely to being electronic. And now that I'm not traveling, of course, I've got the luxury of being able to write to sketch things out, to have paper. Hmm. I think I get a lot of better ideas by writing, by then reviewing, by looking at it, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I've gone retro. Um, <laughs> I'm using pen and paper. How about that? Um, talk to me in a few weeks time. Maybe I've gone back to using a quill pen as well. I don't know. Um, but that's been, I've really enjoyed that, which again may sound strange to people, but uh, yeah, I can be more creative that way. Well, that's what I was going to say is that's opening up a new creative channel or refreshing a creative channel. Yeah, it probably is. Probably is. Well, let's talk a little bit about the new podcast because we are going to continue to have conversations with people in the security space. And I'm excited to hear from those experts. Tell our listeners why we're going to open up a new line of communication. What is your hope with that podcast? We'll see whether or not it works. This is an example of us taking a bit of a risk, isn't it? I think that one of the things that has intrigued me over the last six months has been how have people responded? How have people reacted? Is there anything that people have done that is different that others should benefit from learn from and so those sort of inspirations about how people lead how people get things done when the going's pretty miserable and tough sometimes really found the basis of the idea as far as i'm concerned and it isn't just about as you said you know going to just say security it's about taking inspiration from a whole range of different areas so from music for instance from yes of course business but outside of that, and just opening it up a little bit and saying, well, what, what does good look like? What has good looked like? What will great look like? And what are some really good examples of how people have really got through and created something special over the last six to seven months? And so that's the sort of foundation for it, because I do think that leadership going forward, 
will be about taking inspiration from a number of different elements, because I do think that one of the hopefully beneficial impacts of what we are going through is that there will be change. Businesses will have to change. People will remember the way that they responded, reacted, and that kind of thing. And so I think that it's, a back to my sort of leadership being a journey, really, it's about providing people with different insights from different areas along the journey that inspire, that perhaps spark some different thinking about how they might do something, perhaps in a totally different way. And um, we'll find out because we haven't started doing it yet. So um, it may well be a monumental flop. You never know. Um, <laughs> Could be. On the other hand, I hope that we'll be able to, to, uh, to take something good from it and at least come up with a short podcast, if nothing else. <laughs> <sighs> Is there anything that you want to share with our listeners that we haven't gone over yet? Anything you want to leave them with? One of the myths that I would just want to debunk about leadership. I remember people talking about leadership as being an exceptionally lonely place hmm. because you're out there on your own, you're making the decisions, it's high stress. And I'd offer an alternative to that. It doesn't have to be a lonely place. You'd be absolutely amazed at the number of people that are prepared to work with you, to help you get through a challenging situation. If you just ask. So, the loneliness, I would suggest, for some, not all maybe, but for some, is actually self-inflicted because they've put themselves in that isolated position. And I think it would be worth people just experimenting, just trying something different because it doesn't have to be lonely. You don't have to be on your own trying to solve these things. You have to take responsibility. That's entirely different. You do provide the roadmap and you have to give credit to the people that are helping you on that journey, but actually you're not alone or you don't need to be. That's lovely. And I think that that has been evidenced in our relationship, that our relationship has grown a lot over these last several months. And I feel like one of the benefits of the disruption and then needing to figure out how do we move forward has been more collaboration, more partnership. And I'm going to be bold and say friendship, that there's a lot that we do together that is based in a relationship that's trusting, authentic, and transparent. And that feels a lot less lonely than something that is restricted and can't grow. So I'm glad to be in this with you. And I'm excited about the future of our collaboration and look forward to potentially a short podcast, but maybe more. <laughs> well, hopefully people will find it fun and hopefully they'll enjoy it and they'll want to listen to it. And if we achieve nothing other than that, then that's probably not a bad place. I like that. Thank you. It's a nice conversation. Well, you know, it passed the time, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We thank you for passing the time with us. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation and that you'll be back next time for the second in a series of conversations focused on leadership. In our next episode, Steve will be in conversation with philosopher, author, and speaker Anders Inset. Steve and Anders discuss the importance of leaders engaging in what Anders calls a self-audit, having the strength and courage to get vulnerable, the importance of listening, and more. Here's a preview of that conversation. Because we define ourselves with power and not with strength, right? So we exploit power, but the actual strength is what we need today. We need the strength and the courage, as you said, to tap into that vulnerability. The things that we cannot grasp, where relations are created, where trust is created. A lot of people today also don't trust themselves. So we just live off trying to look important, trying to fill roles, trying to feed off of external impulses. And then the first thing that we need to do is to develop some kind of you know, trust in yourself because only then can you also trust others. And um, if we neglect that, you know, we, we stop seeing when people are lying. We stop seeing when people are not trustworthy because we have left that skill with ourselves. So I think the first thing that we should do is to trust ourselves and tap into that 
actual feeling, to be honest to ourself. We look forward to bringing you the full interview. In the meantime, we invite you to tune into our catalog of video and podcast episodes, all of which you can find at securityforum.org. If you feel like today's conversation was of value, you can subscribe to the audio feed wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd be so grateful if you'd recommend us. Growing our subscriber numbers helps us reach new audiences and helps us continue to bring you these timely discussions. You can always join in the conversation on our LinkedIn page at linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash information dash security dash forum, or get in touch directly through our website, where you can also download ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like these. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Assistant producer, Katie Flood. Mix and Master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening.